HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome and thank you for coming out first thing in the morning on a very, very drizzly day, um, but it's really nice to be here with all of you. Uh, my name is Katie Mosman Wadler. I'm an alum of NYU. I have a master's in food studies from Steinhardt, and I'm currently the executive director of Heritage Radio Network, which is a nonprofit food radio station based in Brooklyn. Um, so it is my great privilege this morning to introduce Dr. Marion Nessel. She is the Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health Emerita, officially, at NYU. Uh, Marion has led a distinguished and groundbreaking career in public health policy and academia, and she led the design of the nation's first comprehensive food studies program, which, as I mentioned, I'm an alum. And uh, her many books include Food Politics, Soda Politics, What to Eat, and now, uh, most recently, The Unsavory Truth, How Food Companies Skew the Science of What We Eat, which is forthcoming. Tuesday. Tuesday. (laughs) Um, So buy it from your favorite bookstore. Um, I was lucky enough to take several of Marion's classes while in the Food Studies program, and I'm so grateful to her for the foundation she laid for me and my entire cohort. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Marion Nessel. So, uh, Marion, our topic today is um, food policy and politics then and now. And so I think um, the the natural way to start off is to ask you a little bit about your early career. You're a molecular biologist turned food politics guru. So um, how did that uh, kind of evolve? What was your early career trajectory and how did you become interested in food policy? Well, I'll tell you that, but first I want to explain why we're using the microphones. We're recording this for Heritage Radio, so um, we're going to just make sure everything's recorded so you'll understand why we're doing this. Um, But yeah, that's the formative question. I was teaching cell and molecular biology at Brandeis University, Um, And the department that I was in, which was biology, had a rule that you could only teach the same course three times in a row. And once you taught it for the third time, you had to change classes. They didn't want faculty to get stale. They wanted faculty to try different kinds of things. And they had another rule, which was that you had to teach whatever the department needed whether you knew anything about it or not. Um, You knew more than undergraduates. You know, you have a PhD, you know more than undergraduates, you know how to learn, go learn it. So they gave me a choice, it was my my three semesters of cell and molecular biology were up, they gave me a choice of human nutrition or human physiology. And I knew that I would never understand kidney function. totally beyond me, and I was kind of curious about nutrition because this was in the early 1970s, and Francis Moore Lappe had just published Diet for a Small Planet. Linus Pauling had just written a book called Vitamin C and the Common Cold, and I was really curious to know whether there was anything in it. 
Um, so I said, okay, I'll do human nutrition. And I went to the library to put out, a, to look at human nutrition textbooks when I was preparing the class, and I had eight of them. And I lined them up on a table and opened them up to the page that listed human nutrition requirements. And I could not find two books that had the same list. <laughs> and I thought, really? We don't know what nutrients are required in the human diet. There are still issues about that. That's really interesting. And I was sold on the whole thing. Um, and there were politics in it from the beginning. I used a book that was prepared by Center for Science and the Public Interest, an advocacy group in Washington, D.C. on food issues. And they had just published a book called Food for People, Not for Profit. That was a collection of essays on topics in food. It could have been published yesterday. Could have come out yesterday. It's the same issues. And so I was talking about these issues in 1976 um, and just have kept doing it ever since. It was like falling in love. I just loved it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you've been involved um, sort of on a government level on a lot of food policy initiatives as an advisor. You helped develop um, one of the sets of dietary guidelines. Could you lay out like a few of those um, advisory positions that you've held? Well, I went to, I actually worked for the government for two years from 1986 to 1988, the Reagan administration. Um, I had come there from Berkeley where I did my degree and I went to Washington incredibly naive. I had no idea how it worked. I didn't really understand the difference between Democrats and Republicans because I came from Berkeley and we thought they were all the same. <laughs> what did we know? Um, so I had a lot of learning to do and it was a steep learning curve. Um, but, uh, but I was there, I, was, I went as senior nutrition policy advisor in the Department of Health and Human Services, and my job was really to write a book, and I did. I was the editor of the Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition and Health that came out in 1988, and I basically wrote it. Um, and the, uh, so that was a, it was an interesting experience. I learned things that I didn't even know I didn't know about how government worked and how you get things done in government. Because a lot of government, you may have noticed, is about not getting things done. Um, and to get something done in government requires an extraordinary level of skill and understanding of how the system works and whose buttons to push. Um, and I happened to be working for somebody who was very skilled at that and taught me a lot about that. It was a really great experience. And on the basis of that, I got hired at NYU and felt like I'd died and gone to heaven. I, f I mean, I knew within two or three months of being in Washington that I'd made a terrible mistake. Um, I'm somebody who's very straightforward about what I say. And you can't survive in Washington that way. Um, and I didn't know where the bodies were buried. And I thought the only way that I'm ever going to be able to survive is just to let people know who I am and pray that someone comes up to me and says, as they did one after another, I can tell that you really don't understand much about Washington. I can help you. And that was how I got it done. Getting that report out on my watch was not easy. Uh, and I had a lot of help. Um, but I knew right from the beginning I had made a terrible mistake. I wasn't going to last in Washington. And I fled back to the university. And I also learned that the world divided into two categories. People in Washington who liked Washington better than New York, and people in Washington who wished they were in New York. <laughs> and I knew which category I was in. I thought if I came to New York, I'd be normal. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we see how that has worked out. Um, <laughs> well, you've done something uh, absolutely extraordinary at NYU, and um, I mean, the creation of the food studies department here, I think is, is incredibly important um, in turning our discipline into one that is taken seriously in academia. And uh, I just 
can't say enough what a, a difference that's made for my career and so many others. Can you talk about the genesis of the program and how you got it to be taken seriously? Well, this was Washington experience put into, you know, universities are no different from government. It's very hard to get things done. And to create a new field is miraculous. It just, you know, the idea that we were able to do that was miraculous. Well, NYU is a very interesting and unusual university in that it's extraordinarily entrepreneurial. If you have an idea and you can figure out how to pay for it, somebody is likely to let you give it a try. And our I came here to chair a department of home economics in 1988. Um, NYU in 1988 was a very different place than it is now. Um, and it wasn't just that it was home economics. I still remember that until 1990, we had transcripts that were done by hand yeah. on paper. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, everybody <laughs> remember that? Um, you know, it was a very, very different place, and it, it was thrilling to be at a place that was getting so much better so rapidly. That was really fun. And in the, our department had hidden under home economics a hotel program in disguise. It was called something else. I think it was called food service management. But we were running a crypto <laughs> hotel management program um, under a different title without any state approval for running a hotel program. And I hope none of you are graduates of it because I'm going to, because I'm going to say something very rude about it. it. It really wasn't a very good program and I was terribly embarrassed about it. I didn't think we were doing what we needed to do. And so when the dean came to me and said, the president of the university wants to move your hotel program into the uh, continuing education school. The um, uh, what's it called now? I think. Yeah, the, yeah, school of professional the School of Professional Studies. Um, they wanted to take all the hotel management programs and put them in one place. This was a program that brought in a million dollars a year in tuition to our department, and that meant that we were going to be losing a million dollars in tuition. Everybody felt really sorry for us. So when the dean said, um, you know, how, are you, how would you feel about losing this program? I said, learn, having learned in Washington, it depends on what I get. <laughs> and she, being an excellent dean, said, what do you want? And here I cannot explain, but my, the answer that came out of my mouth was, I want to create a program in food studies. I had been hanging around with a group that ran trips all over the world where they invited food writers, chefs, and a few, acad a few lucky academics to kind of go to these meetings in usually places that were olive oil going region, growing regions because it was funded by the International Olive Oil Council. Um, <laughs> but I had been meeting all these people who were talking about how they wished they could learn more about food. And it was just in my head. And there it was, and she said, and her response was, what's food studies? And that's the question that still gets asked. <laughs> um, so I made up something and said, well, it's like all the other programs at NYU that are called studies. <laughs> French studies, Spanish studies, um, environmental studies, women's studies, whatever. Um, and she said, well, if you can figure out how to fund it, we'll let you give it a try. And that was it. And I had a, a food consultant who helped me with it. We had an advisory committee. And we went from concept to state approval in nine months. Not bad. And one week after the state approved it, Marion Burroughs, who was a reporter for the New York Times, wrote about it. And we had people in our office that afternoon holding the clipping in their hand saying, I've waited all my life for this program, take me. And we had a class in the fall. That article came out in July, and we had a class in the fall. It was a miracle. Um, so that was almost 25 years ago, and now there are food studies programs, or their equivalent, in universities all over the country and in many places in the world. Ours was the first. 
to be a, a, a we we have academic to have ours was the first academic program undergraduate master's doctoral degrees, um, and now there are lots of them. So they compete, and we worried about that. They compete for students, but on the other hand, they provide wonderful opportunities for our doctoral <laughs> students to get jobs. <laughs> um, we told our early doctoral students that they would never, they should never expect to teach at a university because universities are very department driven and because there were no other food studies departments the chances of their getting a job were very slim. They should have a plan B. All of our doctoral students who want academic jobs have them. It's been really exciting to watch. Right. Yeah. So you are also a prolific writer, and um, you write almost every day, right? Mm, um, pretty much. You have a, a wonderful blog, which I'll, I'll give everybody the URL. Um, but also, you have a brand new book, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about this. I, many of your books have aimed to sort of shed light on why we have so much trouble figuring out what we should eat. And um, this book is one example of why that becomes so complicated. Um, can you give us the background on Unsavory Truth? Yeah, it's coming out on Tuesday. I'm so excited. This was a three and a half year project, um, and I thought it would never come out. So uh, it's Tuesday, um, is the publication day. Uh, so you're getting a preview. So this book grew out of all of my other work. Um, the, I, I wrote my first, the book is about food industry funding of nutrition research and how food, industry, food company funding biases nutrition research. And I wrote my first article about it in 2001. So I've been talking about these kinds of things or thinking about them for a long time. I incorporated that article into my first book um, in recent years, and that was Food Politics, which came out in 2002. And then um, in 2015, I started noticing more and more studies that were coming out that had titles that made me think, who funded this? I would look at the title and think, why would anybody do a study like this? Who funded this? I'll, I'll just give you the most recent example that I just ran across last week. A study with a title that says, chewing gum is an excellent delivery system for vitamins. I thought, who funded that? Would you believe the maker of a vitamin supplemented chewing gum company? Um, so in 2015, I started, I started noticing these. And they were annoying, because they almost always came out with results that favored the sponsor's interest in some way. Um, so in 2015, I started collecting them. And every time I came across five, studies with results that favored the sponsor's interest, I would post them on my blog. Um, and I did that for a year. And I asked people, if you see industry-funded studies that come out with results that do not favor the sponsor's interest, please send them to me. <laughs> and at the end of a year, I had collected and posted 168 studies on my blog, and 156 of them came out with results favorable to the sponsor. Only 12 did not. Um, so that was one thing. I was sort of, in my head, I was prepared to deal with this question. And so that was 2015 to 2016. Towards the end of 2015, in August that year, the New York Times had a front page article about Coca-Cola's funding of researchers at the University of of Colorado and a university in Carolina and Georgia, I think, um, called the Global Energy Balance Network, where the, uh, the investigators were saying that you didn't have to worry about what you ate if you were worried about obesity. All you had to do was be more active and not even that much more active, just a little bit more active and that would take care of your uh, overweight. I wish that were true, I really do, but most evidence shows that it's not. 
And the Times article, which started on the front page and continued to an inside page, had a quote from me, oh no, not again, or something like that, <laughs> um, across, as a banner across the top of the inside page. And you couldn't miss my quote. And I got a lot of calls from reporters. And probably in the week following that article, I got 30 calls from reporters. And they would say things like, we just can't believe this. Coca-Cola funds studies like this? Investigators take money from Coca-Cola to do studies like this? Universities allow their faculty to do this kind of research? They were incredulous. And I thought, I've got another book to write. <laughs> if reporters are this incredulous about this kind of thing and they don't know, then probably lots of other people don't know how much of an impact food industry funding has on what we think we know about nutrition research. So that was sort of the second major thing. And then I started collecting, um, doing a more systematic collection and started, started to read the literature, which I can describe in one word, vast. Another word, overwhelming. There's really a lot of it on the effects of tobacco, chemical, and pharmaceutical drug industry funding of research, particularly drug industry funding because it's so easy to measure. Um, and you can look at how pharmaceutical industry funding of, of specific research on drugs influences physicians' prescription practices and their opinions on advisory committees. So while I was reviewing all of that, the most bizarre thing happened, and that was, you remember the Russian hacking of emails, of Hillary Clinton's emails? Well, that happened you know, sort of late in 2016, I think, was when all that happened. Um, and what does that have to do with this book? It has everything to do with this book, because one set of emails that got picked up by the Russian hackers and posted on a site called DC Leaks, I heard about because I started getting emails from people saying, Marion, you're in the emails. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> How could I possibly be in the Hillary Clinton staff emails? I had nothing to do with that campaign. <clears throat> and they said, go look. And I went and looked, and it turns out <clears throat> that an advisor for Hillary Clinton, a woman named Capricia Marshall, uh, who I'd never heard of before, while she was working on Hillary Clinton's campaign, was also consulting for Coca-Cola and getting $7,000 a month consulting fee, not bad. Um, and in the emails that were collected from Capricia Marshall in her correspondence with the vice president for Coca-Cola, was a report about a lecture that I had given in Australia at the beginning of 2016, <clears throat> where I had been working, I had a sabbatical and I was working with an investigator in, um, in our, at the University of Sydney, and I gave a lecture to the Nutrition Society of Australia, and somebody said, you know, there's somebody from Coca-Cola here in the audience, and I said, that's fine. I had just published Soda Politics, it had just come out, so uh, my book Soda Politics. I assumed that somebody from Coca-Cola was in every lecture I gave. You know who you are. <laughs> you know who you are. <clears throat> the, um, and that person had taken notes on my lecture, very good ones actually, high marks for very clear notes, and had advised Coca-Cola to keep an eye on my activities in Australia <laughs> and the activities of the woman that I was working with, um, in whose group I was working, and that email got sent up the chain of command, ended up with this vice president, and ended up on DC leaks. Uh, on this website, I just could hardly believe it. That's the first chapter of the book. Because those emails not only were, were uh, showing how Coca-Cola was monitoring the activities of people in far-flung corners of the world, um, but also how they were trying to influence reporters, how they were trying to influence research. And that's the basis of this book. That's what this book is about. And it has 
made you somewhat of a controversial figure, but certainly not for the first time. <laughs> not for the um, first time. <laughs> there's a, a statement in the book um, regarding the Coca-Cola funded research um, from Representative Laura DeRosa from Connecticut, and she compares the Coca-Cola funding of nutrition research to the tobacco companies who were conducting research designed to deliberately mislead the public about the risks of smoking. Um, I'd like to talk about what what's the extent of the problem is this as bad as that? Um, what are some of the impacts of the nutrition industry, or the food companies and food industry funding nutrition research? Yeah, food's not cigarettes. Cigarettes are much simpler. Don't smoke. Um, food, you can't say don't eat. Um, uh, you have to say something much more complicated, which is eat this instead of that or eat less in general, those are very, very difficult messages for people to understand and do something about. But the, and so food companies are not, they're not one product either, they're thousands and thousands and thousands of products. So the whole thing is just a lot messier and of course I, I love the mess. I find the mess really interesting and I love nutrition science because it's so messy. Um, but the, the way in which food companies try to sell food products is very much the same as the cigarette companies tried to sell cigarettes. And in fact, it's called the playbook, the cigarette industry playbook. And one of the things you want to do is you want to cast doubt on the science. Any science that links your product to ill health, you want to cast enough doubt about it so there's uncertainty. And we see this in climate change denial, you know, there's plenty of uncertainty in that, and it's what's most used. And companies are very good at doing that. And so the research that Coca-Cola funded, and I want to say that lots and lots and lots of food companies do this, Coca-Cola got caught. It just, in those emails, it just got caught. Uh, but lots of other companies do the same thing, and we don't have the same kind of emails for them. But Coca-Cola funds three different kinds of research. It funds research to show that sugary drinks aren't bad for health. Um, it funds research to show that any research that says that sugary drinks are bad for health is so flawed that you shouldn't pay any attention to it. Um, and it funds research to show that exercise is more important than what you eat in obesity and obesity-related problems. So that's that's its deliberate strategy. It's funded hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies. The result of the New York Times article was particularly interesting because Coca-Cola was very embarrassed by the article. And the uh, head of Coca-Cola said, okay, this isn't our company. Our company is much better than this. Um, and you know, obviously we're being perceived as being manipulative. We're gonna go completely transparent. And we're going to post on our website a list of everybody that we give money to. And to my absolute astonishment, they did. And they have kept it up. And if you Google Coca-Cola transparency, up will come this website in which you can look at and search for who gets money from Coca-Cola. It's kind of amazing, actually. And of course, that opened Coca-Cola up to further analysis. Um, I mean, I bet they regret doing that. <laughs> so you can then analyze um, who gets funding and is, uh, and, the, and is revealed by Coca-Cola and whether they reveal the Coca-Cola funding in their published papers. Uh, these analyses are being done all the time. Um, and they show that there's a lack of transparency on both sides. Uh, often, but again, I think it's because Coca-Cola got caught. There seems to be a huge amount of discomfort among many researchers and academic institutions around revealing these sorts of funding sources. Um, you know, a lot of journals require disclosures of funding, but it's not always immediately apparent. There might be upfront that mm -hmm. um, gets listed instead. Uh, so, why do researchers and nutrition professionals? Uh, potentially stake their reputation or risk their reputation of professional integrity to accept industry funding? Well, they get the funding because they don't see anything wrong with it. Um, they don't think it influences them. Um, and I, I believe that they believe that sincerely. 
Um, they don't think it influences them. They need money for their research. Uh, and they don't see anything wrong with it. And, the, they, and they are completely unfamiliar with the very large body of psychological and behavioral research that shows the influence of gifts. <laughs> um, and there is a very large body of literature that shows that gifts have an influence, but the influence is unconscious. People are unaware of the influence, they didn't intend to be influenced, um, and they don't recognize the influence. So that's what this enormous body of research shows. So what this means is that there's a lot of denial around it, and their unfamiliarity with this research, and there's no reason at all for nutrition researchers to know anything about it because they studied something completely different, um, they're quite offended by the idea that the the funding would have anything at all to do with their uh, design or conduct, conduct or interpretation of the science. But there's research on that too. And that research shows that the influence of gifts affects the design of the research question primarily. It's the way you ask the research question where the biases come in the most. And you know, as an example, there's a really big difference between asking as a research question, how can I find out what the effect of this particular food is on health, since I'm talking about Coca-Cola, um, the, uh, an open-ended question. What is the effect of drinking a certain amount of Coca-Cola on health over a long period of time? That's a legitimate scientific question. But I get letters all the time from food companies asking for research proposals to demonstrate the benefits of their product. That's a very different question. Um, we are looking for research to demonstrate the benefits of yogurt. We're looking for research to demonstrate the benefits of grapes on heart disease and cancer risk. I get those letters all the time. And if you're asking for research to demonstrate benefits, you're going to get research designed to demonstrate benefits. It's not that hard to do. Um, and that's, so it's not the conduct of the research that's the problem. It's not that these companies are buying research. It's much more subtle than that. And that makes it very hard to talk about and also explains why people are so outraged. In the book, there's also a really delightful um, conflict of interest bingo figure oh, yes. <laughs> that's um, pretty mm -hmm. wonderful. And there, there was one on there that I found surprising. These are all the different forms of, of denials of conflict of interest that can exist. And um, one of the forms that it took was something uh, called overkill, which is um, researchers in their disclosures on uh, a paper that is published listing to a, an almost sarcastic, ridiculous extent every possible tie that they or any family member might have had to the point where there was one paper that had a full page in fine two print. Full two full pages. Two full pages. pages in a journal of disclosures, um, which included his wife's work with some charity and his daughter's collection of something else, I thought it was a joke. Mm -hmm. um, and actually wrote, uh, I did a blog post on it and said, this is really overkill, what's going on here? And the researcher contacted me and said, this is what the journals require. And I, con I actually contacted the head of that particular, the editor of that journal, and said, what is this? Two full pages in a journal? And he said, well, we're an online journal, so we don't care about space. And we just let the, and the authors do whatever they want to do. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a problem. Might, might have reflected a certain attitude for that I particular would think author. So. Yes. Um, so say there's a food company that truly wants to contribute to the public good mm -hmm. through funding scientific research. Uh, there are some proposed ways that this might work. I thought some of the ideas in the book felt a little bit radical. Um, you talk about potentially doing uh, pooling of funds or um, potentially 
mandatory taxes or levies on food companies similar to like the checkoff programs which the most famous one is got milk but sort of um, mandatory payments from food producers to fund research or in that case to fund marketing as in the checkoff programs so can you describe you know in in a idealist world how would food companies support research in the public interest well anytime a single food company sponsors a study there's influence of that company and the investigator if the investigator wants to keep getting funding from that company the investigator has to pre produce research that the company's going to like otherwise if you produce negative research the company's not going to fund you again um, I mean that's human and we're talking about human things here so there have been several attempts over the years actually they're pretty ancient um, they occurred in the middle of the last century where there was an organization called the Nutrition Foundation that collected um, funding from a lot of different food companies, pooled it and distributed the funds the way NIH distributes funds to researchers. And that worked for a while, but the foundation wanted to keep getting those donations and in order to do that, they had to find ways to please the companies and they ended up sounding like they worked for the companies. It really, it's, a, it's kind of an amazing story. So I ended up thinking that the only way to do this would be to tax companies on the basis of their um, sales and a very small tax and then pool that money and then have some independent third party distribute the funds and that way no one food company could influence, could exert influence consciously or unconsciously um, and investigators wouldn't have to deal with anybody except the third party and that would do it. But there's no reason, well first of all taxes are impossible these days but food companies wouldn't want to voluntarily pool their money because the whole point of their funding research is to get research to demonstrate the benefits of their products. That's the point of it. So I think we're kind of stuck. And so my advice to food companies is if you are going to give the money, you want to make sure that the research questions are open-ended and you want to keep out of it. Well, that's not what they want to do, particularly. Hello. <laughs> so in the sort of more practical sense then of the, the real world that we find ourselves living in, um, you know, the way that most of us receive and process information about nutrition is through news media, mm -hmm. which often doesn't disclose industry funding. Mm -hmm. um, like as you said, you know, the reason for this book was that many journalists didn't, weren't even aware mm -hmm. of the issue. So as an individual, um, what are some ways that we can interpret nutrition science in the news? Well, I always say if a study seems incredible, um, it probably is. <laughs> um, and a certain amount of skepticism about single studies is always warranted. Um, and if a study seems like it's a breakthrough, there are no breakthroughs in nutrition or they're really so rare that, you know, you, the word breakthrough is a tip-off that something's being sold to you. Anytime I hear the words, everything you thought you knew about nutrition is wrong, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, that's, an, that's like a red flag flying in the air. Um, and just a certain amount of skepticism. Um, you want to look to see in reports of study of nutrition studies whether the funder is mentioned. I think reporters are getting better about mentioning the funder and saying this study is independently funded. This study was funded by the maker of this particular chewing gum. Um, and, the, and the reports say that. So uh, that's helpful. Um, and if a study is contrary to your understanding of nutrition, there's probably something questionable about it because science works incrementally and although it may seem that nutrition advice changes all the time, we're still promoting fruits and vegetables <laughs> <laughs> and have been for a long time. And I think that's a really good point too, is that you know, individual ingredients and produce especially, um, they don't have this corporate money behind them 
to promote them. And mm. so what ends up happening is the processed food company, sort of the more a food product gets touched, the more likely that company is to be influencing nutrition science and the media um, through marketing budgets and funding well, for they have more research. Mo- processed foods have more money. They're much more profitable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, as an individual, um, we have a question. Two quick oh, questions. Yeah. Um, the food labels we see on the packaging in stores, can we trust them to be true? Are they monitored? Are they, yeah. They are by the Food and Drug Administration? Yeah. Who? Yeah, the food labels are monitored by the. The question was, um, are, can we trust food labels? Every now and then the FDA does a study, and pretty much the food labels say what, when they say what's in the product, that's what's in the product. The bigger the company is, the more likely they are to be accurate. Um, For supplements, it's a completely different story. That's totally different. The FDA doesn't monitor it, and there's been lots of evidence that the labels of supplements are not particularly accurate. Not always. I'm going to ask just a quick um, one more question, and then I'll open it up to the audience for (laughs) some questions. But um, sort of in the big big picture now, um, how are food politics changing, and as individuals, what can we do um, Mm -hmm. to look out for our health and our best interest? Well, I think we have to look out for our own health and best interest, because nobody else is doing it right now. Um, And, you know, we have a political system in which most of the efforts to try to get decent health care to the public and make sure that the poor aren't starving to death are being taken away or undermined. And that means um, we have to take care of ourselves and try to take care of other people as best we can. And I, the way I put it is voting with your fork, those are your own food choices, <laughs> and voting with your vote, which is, means you have to get politically active. Run for office, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, vote with your fork and vote with your vote. Um, we have a question in the front row. When you were talking about uh, labels, one of the big problems is for people to know what they're reading in a label. It isn't so much are the labels honest or, or, or credible, but uh, there are so many things in a label mm-hmm. and people have to get used to knowing certain key words to look for and say, oh no, I don't want that product, like mm-hmm. canola oil. Uh, I'm the author of my Bible for the extended lifespan, and I broke all audience call-in records on Bloomberg Radio and television, and people, the biggest show was the extended lifespan, are you prepared for it health-wise? <laughs> and people called in by the thousands, and they said, no, no, I am not prepared to live healthy till I'm 110. And, uh, so I'm not either. <laughs> <laughs> but we can be. It, and it's an effort. Being well naturally is an effort, but that's the best effort to make as opposed to just running around with prescription drugs, yes. which will kill you. Yes. Sure. Thank you for that. Can I ask you, what, what's the most important thing that you've found out about food in the last 25 years? The most important thing? Oh, not to eat ultra-processed foods. Right. Just to eat real food. Um, I, I mean, it's so simple. I am always quoting Michael Pollan, but the journalist Michael Pollan says, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Really, that's all there is to it. Everything else is fluff. Nutri-fluff <laughs> is what I call it. Uh, really simple. Question in the second round. Uh, The question is about the keto diet, which is extremely high in fat and extremely low in carbohydrates. Um, I can't imagine why anybody would want to eat that way. Um, But, uh, you know, it's very popular these days. And the first thing it does is it makes you lose huge amounts of water. um, So that that makes you feel like you're losing a lot of weight very quickly. Um, as a quick weight loss diet, it probably works for two or three weeks. I think it's fine. Um, you smell bad because ketones smell bad. Um, you can t- uh, you have bad breath, <laughs> the, uh, but that's okay. Lots of people are doing it. They swear by it. Fine. All diets will help you lose weight if you follow them. It's maintaining the weight loss. That's the problem. That's the problem. 
-hmm. I don't think the keto diet is much fun, but that's my personal. Yes. Uh, As you were describing before, uh, that there don't seem to be any people or agencies that are being helpful in terms of information. Uh, When I attended Weight Watchers, they advise you to shop around the edge of the supermarket Mm -hmm. and don't go to the middle. And that was very helpful to me. Well, that's my book, What to Eat. (laughs) That's the whole theme of that book. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, that's where the, except that the supermarkets have wisened up on that, yes. and so they're now putting junk foods in the middle of the produce section. You have to be careful. Yeah, we have a question in the back. Um, well, I completely agree on the non-processed fruits and plants and vegetables. What is your feeling on different proteins? On different proteins? Yes. Proteins are a non-issue in American diets. Most Americans consume twice the amount of protein that they need. So it's a complete non-issue. Um, you know, if, if you're pro- the healthiest diets are plant-based, so you want to get most of your proteins from plants. But without, you know, you don't have to be a vegetarian or vegan. Um, variety is the key to healthy diets. Variety of unprocessed foods. You know, it's really not complicated. Just complicated to do. <laughs> Cook, cooking is a big help. <laughs> sure, why not? Why <laughs> not? Um, what is your feeling uh, about organic food? Uh, what is my feeling about organic? It's funny. I'm doing a. Blo- I just wrote a blog post that I'm going to post next week on organics because there's been a new study that's just come out, an observational study that shows a 25 percent reduction in cancer over seven years. Um, in a population of 70,000 people, um, and they looked at how much organic they were eating, and the ones who were eating the largest uh, percentage of organic foods had the lowest risk of cancer, and for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the reduction was almost 90%. That's an observational study, so everybody who knows anything about science is going to start screaming right away, but, but, but. And there were lots of flaws in the study, and there are questions about how well the dietary intake data were collected, and they didn't measure the level of pesticides. And the, the rationale for it is that the pesticides that are used for conventional agriculture, and in particular GMO agriculture, um, have a lot of pesticides that have been associated with cancer risk, and so that's the hypothesis. Uh, and there's a lot more work that needs to be done, but if you can afford organics, eat organics. You know, the big issue there is price, and that um, puts organics into an elitist category, which I wish they weren't. That has a lot to do with the way the government supports some kinds of agriculture and not other kinds of agriculture. But if you can afford organics, there's nothing wrong with them. Um, and maybe they're healthier. I don't know. It um, seems reasonable to me. I'm for them. Well, for, for one reason uh, that's totally demonstrable, and that is they're much better for the environment. Much better. They use fewer toxic pe- pesticides. They're much better for soil. Um, and so I'm for them, if you can afford them. Yes, um, you've made the point, and obviously the book makes the point, that uh, research sponsored by food companies tends to be skewed because they want the result they want. My question, and I have no idea what the answer is, I'm just very curious, it is food research also sponsored, let's say, by nonprofits, mm-hmm. people like the Ford Foundation and so forth. And Robert Wood Johnson is the biggest funder. <laughs> okay. And is that kind of research also skewed, mm-hmm. or is that straight down the middle? So I mean, mm-hmm. on both sides of the coin, we get skewed mm-hmm. research. Yeah, I have a whole chapter addressing that question. Um, uh, There's a huge attack on nutrition research right now, coming from many, many different places. Um, And some of that attack is coming from statisticians who who just think that observational research doesn't tell you anything. And some of it is coming from people who take food industry funding and think that other kinds of funding sources or what they call dietary ideology, or other kinds of issues like that are equally biasing. For example, organics, for example. 
Um, when I see a study that says organics are more nutritious or less nutritious than conventionally produced fruits and vegetables, I can guess who paid for the study. I can guess. Um, and I'm usually right the, on that. Um, there's one, there's a statistician at Stanford, a man named Johnny Ioannidis, who says that nutrition researchers should disclose their dietary practices and their dietary ideology. If they're vegans, they should say so in their paper. Um, if they follow a, ketogen, a ketogenic diet, they should say so in their paper. Um, but I think those kinds of biases are distinctly different from industry biases, and let me tell you why. First of all, every investigator who does science um, has a hypothesis and is wedded to that hypothesis in some way. Therefore, every scientific study comes from somebody who wants the results to come out in a particular way. But those scientists differ in their ideology and in their personal beliefs and in their personal practices. And so the results of studies differ all over the place. Food industry funded studies tend to come out in favor of the sponsor. I think that's a big difference. You can't do science without having hypotheses and biases, but you can do science without taking food industry funding. I think that's distinctly different. Not everyone will agree with that, but I see a, a distinct difference. We have time for maybe one more quick question in the back. I want to know, a diet soda is harmful to your health? I have no idea. And part of the reason that I have no idea is so much of that research is done by companies that make um, those artificial sweeteners. And those studies tend to show that artificial sweeteners are safe at any amount. Um, studies by independent investigators differ. Some show harm, some don't. Uh, I can't figure it out. But I don't like the way they taste. So they're a non-issue for me. One of my food rules is never eat anything artificial. So they're off my dietary radar. Will you, because you disclose it in the book, um, would you mind disclosing your own personal diet since you alluded to it? <laughs> I'm an omnivore and I follow my own dietary principles which can be summarized by Michael Pollan's seven words, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I eat everything, um, I love food. Um, and I'll do a complete confession. Anything with sugar in it, I'm for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Marion, thank you so much this morning. It's thank you. Really, really <laughs> fascinating. Thank you all for being fun. here. I would really, really encourage you to check out Marion's blog, which is foodpolitics.com. It's wonderful and often humorous and fascinating. Um, Unsavory Truth will be available in bookstores on Tuesday this week, so please pick that up. Also, I'm going to put in a shameless plug that you can find this recording and over 10,000 more at heritageradionetwork.org. Thank you again for being here. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please... Join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.